Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 313. It's not an easy thing to find a good interviewer. I find a lot of people who conduct interviews online are sitting there with a canned list of questions that they're just rattling off. But that's not interesting for the person being interviewed. It's certainly not interesting for the audience. And it's just awkward for everybody concerned. What you need is a conversation where there's a back and forth and the host is responding to what the interviewee is saying and, it's, and it flows and it works nicely. Well, I had an experience like that not long ago, as a matter of fact, when I was a guest on the Lions of Liberty podcast, which I recommend to you guys when you're saying to yourselves, my goodness, I've listened to all 313 episodes of the Tom Woods Show. What's left for me to do? Well, check out lionsofliberty.com, where you'll find the Lions of Liberty podcast, which is going to be starting up twice a week. It had been a weekly podcast. It'll be twice a week from now on. You'll actually hear that announcement in this episode, because I'd like to play for you the interview that I did with Mark Clare, who's the host of the Lions of Liberty podcast. And make sure and check out the show notes page for today's episode at tomwoods.com slash 313. You'll get links to the Lions of Liberty podcast if you want to check them out further. Links to books that are mentioned in our conversation. I'll link to my book Nullification, to Real Descent, to a Ron Paul book. There'll be a number of important links there at tomwoods.com slash 313. tomwoods.com slash 313 is the show notes page for today's episode. On tomorrow's program, I'm going to welcome James Babb to the show for the first time. Jim's going to talk to us about the Ross Ulbricht case, and we're going to talk about jury nullification. Very important stuff tomorrow, so make sure and tune in for that. One more quick thing. On yesterday's show, I said that today I would be going through all the different things that I'm looking to accomplish in 2015. I'm going to postpone that till tomorrow because today's episode is already pretty long as it is. So right now, let me, in fact, turn it over to Mark Clare and his interview with me from the Lions of Liberty podcast. Lionsofliberty.com, show notes page today, tomwoods.com slash 313. Here we go. Tom Woods, welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Glad to be here, Mark. Well, Tom, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. And, you know, I've, over the years, I've found myself a big fan of your writing, of your speeches. I think you have a real knack for communicating things in a way that can really appeal to people that are not necessarily libertarians. And I think that's why you've achieved a decent amount of mainstream success. And, you know, whenever I have a new guest on the show, I always like to start out asking them how they first became a libertarian, what really set off that spark. And you have a great story in the first chapter of your book, Real Descent, entitled, I Was Fooled by the War Makers. And I just want to tee you up for this by reading the first line of this chapter where you state, 20 years ago, as I was completing my freshman year in college, I was a full-blown neoconservative. So, Tom, why don't you just start off by telling us how you went from a self-described full-blown neoconservative to the index card burning libertarian you are today? When you look at how I handle conservative opponents today, and the types of arguments I use against them, I use those arguments because they worked against me back when I was a fairly conventional conservative, neoconservative. So it's not an accident, it's not at random that I use the arguments that I do when I just say to people, you should be consistent about what you believe. You, you, you're supposed to believe in private property and all these other things, but you, you make like 28 random exceptions to these general principles. Do you believe in them or don't you? So that's what worked for me, by and large, but I went off to college in 1990, and I was a middle-of-the-road moderate Republican, and I believed in a strong national defense, like I believe, you know, all the slogans that I'd been taught, I imbibed them all. You're looking at a guy who, in 1984, I watched as a 12-year-old, I watched the entire Democratic and Republican conventions, in their entirety, watched every bit of the, at least of the televised portions, every single night I was in front of the TV. That's not normal. Wow, now, I have an 11-year-old, and the idea that one year from now she could be in a position to be doing that is, is uh, <laughs> deeply disturbing to me. Would you even allow her to do that? I would have to intervene. I have to say, now look here. You know, <laughs> I, I have some experience in this area. This is not going to do you any good. Well, the, the long and the short of it is I went off to college, and it was such a disorienting thing to go from a 
fairly conservative little town to the middle of Cambridge, Massachusetts, that I became more confrontational. It wasn't that I decided, well, I better blend in and go with the flow. That's not my personality. My personality was, well, you people are going to assault me at every turn and everything I believe, then I'm going to fight back even harder. And I used to fight against the debate with the commies. There was an actual communist newspaper that was distributed near the freshman dining hall in those days. And I used to, I used to confront them. I used to debate them. And this got me more and more interested in the world of ideas, and I was doing more and more reading all the time. But when you're constantly under assault, it does force you to really, really examine what you believe. And I wanted to be consistent. I wanted to, to really believe in something the whole way. And I started reading you know, conservative and libertarian magazines because I, I wanted to hone my debating skills. And so I attended, for example, an event of the Institute for Humane Studies for a week one summer, and that really got me thinking, boy, I thought I was for the free market. I'm a pathetic bum compared to these people. <laughs> and, and it was that combined with the next year going to the Mises University summer program at the Mises Institute that really made me think, you know, if I'm going to be for something, I want to be for the whole thing of that something. I started reading a magazine called Chronicles. They've excommunicated me, unfortunately, but they were like old, old, timey conservatives, and they were writing articles about how all the foreign intervention of the you know early 1990s, like the Gulf War and all that, was really opposed to traditional conservatism. This was a phony, baloney, interventionist substitute by people who, most of whom had been liberals in their former lives, and, and I thought, wait a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, you're telling me that I've been fed a phony baloney version of conservatism, and that really ticked me off, so I wanted to read more. What else have I been deceived about? So that's why I love giving these neocons a hard time by calling them not real conservatives and they're fakes. And by the way, I'm just getting done talking about the French Revolution in the Ron Paul curriculum course that I'm doing on, the, on Western civilization. Edmund Burke's whole point as a conservative at that time was to say that societies are much too variegated and delicate and intricate things to think that you could just go abroad and just create a whole new society from scratch or that you could do that in your own society that people with big brains and clipboards could sit down and design a society that is exactly the opposite of conservatism that was Burke's whole point of his opposition to the French Revolution was that and yet I see these so-called conservatives saying that they're gonna remake Afghanistan they're going to remake Iraq in the Western image. They are the anti-Edmund Burke. They are the anti-conservative. So I love using this stuff against them. And then, of course, the, the war stuff, well, that's a whole separate question. And I devote the whole first section of my new book, Real Descent, is dedicated to war, foreign policy, and why the conservatives are not conservative and why they're terrible on foreign policy. All that is, is covered there. But I realize that it did not make sense for me to say – I don't trust anything this federal government says when it comes to milk subsidies or whatever trivial thing it was. But when it tells me it needs to invade Iraq to reverse its invasion of Kuwait, well, I'll stand up and salute. I thought, well, maybe there's a little skepticism called for here as well. And once you walk down that road, well, there ain't no turning back. And I think that war issue is what gets a lot of people into libertarianism overall because it's the one thing where – Ultimately, both quote unquote sides of this political debate, uh, maybe the Democrats will have some little anti-war rhetoric mixed in, but you still see Democratic presidents going to war and certainly conservative Republican presidents are always basically frothing at the mouth for this stuff, at least a lot of the mainstream guys. So, I mean, the war is the one issue where I think it finally kind of pulled me out of my, I guess, my slumber, so to speak, um, when, in my early 20s when I started seeing, well, why are we actually invading Afghanistan after all these guys from Saudi Arabia came over? And I started listening to this Ron Paul character who was talking about, you know, non-intervention and how there's actually real reasons for terrorism. It's not just people randomly latching it out because we have, you know, cheap cupcakes or whatever, whatever capitalism is providing us that they hate so much. There are actual causes for this, and it is the imperial wars and, and all the intervention overseas. Now, um, I want to talk about this concept of intervention a little bit, because I think it is a difficult subject to communicate to other people with, because, you know, it's kind of a talking point of, of libertarians, the concept of non-intervention. And I think sometimes people can sort of get confused because they'll think, well, wait, why can't we intervene to defend the rights of others? And obviously, 
people that have been studying the history of the U.S. government and, and what they've actually been doing can tell you that, well, no, the U.S. government has not proven any sort of interest in actually defending individual rights. I mean, if you see the war on drugs at home, clearly nobody's trying to defend individual rights there. So why should we trust them to do something like that overseas? But as a principle, do you think non-intervention as a prescription for the U.S. government, I could it definitely make sense that you know, we shouldn't be doing all this stuff. But as an actual base principle, that's where I think some confusion about non-intervention happens, because just at the most you know basic level, if, say, my neighbor is getting raped and I, I see someone break into her house and I see her getting raped, well, she's she's in trouble. Obviously, I can intervene and help her. So, you know, I, despite the fact that she's on her private property or, you know, a sovereign territory, whatever you want to call it. So how do you kind of merge those two concepts, like describing non-intervention as a prescription for government as opposed to, you know, how actual individual humans can act towards each other? Well, for one thing, I would say an individual human being can go over and intervene if he wants to in the same way that an individual human being could go next door and help somebody who would want help in a situation like that and in which the moral law is obviously being violated and the non-aggression principle is being violated and there's, there isn't a jury in the world who would convict you for going and trying to rescue somebody. So in a way, it's the same principle. If you want to go abroad and try to help this or that group, you can do that. But one of the differences between the two situations, uh, there are many, one of them would be there are a lot of layers of propaganda and misinformation between you and what's going on in Syria. Whereas when you're looking at something with your own eyes next door, you can see somebody's being attacked. Well, chances are, you know, the attack ought to be stopped. Like, chances are you know all you need to know. But what do Americans really know about what's going on in Syria or what's going on in, in Libya? They get information that has been, well, distorted and manipulated by people who have a vested interest in one way or another in being involved there so that Americans are not making informed choices almost ever. Secondly, look at the track record these people have had. I mean, Libya is a complete wreck. It's a total basket case. And that's true of example after example after example. These people are the ones who do not deserve the benefit of the doubt. Or even in some of the more popular interventions of the 1990s. For example, bombing the Serbs over Kosovo in 1999. Well, we were told that there were hundreds of thousands of deaths of all Albanian Muslims, and the Secretary of State at the time said, or may have been Secretary of Defense, said, we believe they may have been murdered. Well, it turns out the they didn't even exist because when they wound up looking at it after the fact, actually a grand total, not hundreds of thousands, a grand total of 2,100 people on both sides of what was a civil war had died. And meanwhile, the peace-loving Albanian Muslims uh, went around uh, destroying Orthodox monasteries and churches and burning them to the ground. And to say that, well, this is just a clear-cut case of bad guys with horns and good guys with angels' wings is the typical government attempt to justify its own power lust. But the reality was not that way at all. And very, very few people, once the truth came out, very few people said, oops, sorry, I guess we got that completely wrong. We'll be more careful next time. They don't even joke about being more careful next time. So when I look at that, and then when I look at the way the military-industrial complex is involved in this, which is not involved when you're looking next door at your neighbor being attacked, right. and the profiteering that's associated with it, and I mean, I've written, I have a whole chapter in my book, Rollback, about how the military-industrial complex really functions, then I say to myself, look, I, sorry, I guess my instinct is I never believe these people. And secondly, I feel like every single thing they do involve themselves in, they wind up making vastly, vastly worse. The Middle East is vastly worse than it was before they started doing anything, for example. And I think that goes back to the original reason for the invasions. You know, the, if the invasions, well, I mean, you wouldn't really invade and call it defending individual rights. But if they were really there to actually defend the rights of the people in these countries... And, you know, maybe you wouldn't have these problems if the mission was limited to that kind of thing. But that's clearly not the mission ever with this stuff. Clearly, it's it's an actual invasion. It's an imperial kind of thing where we're really just invading for resources, for political reasons. And the rights of the people on the ground are usually violated, not defended. And that's why we get all this blowback. That's why we see terrorist breeding in these places. Because, well, hey, if someone comes and drops a bomb on my house, well, I'm going to say, oh, 
Well, I now hate those people because they just killed my family. And so we can see how this applies to foreign policy when you repeat this process tens of thousands of times over and over. Yeah, maybe people in the world aren't going to really love the United States government that much. And that's a complete opposition to if I see my neighbor in trouble, I see her getting raped. Well, I can go stop it. I can even gather my neighbors to go stop it. And we can apply that same concept everywhere. What I can't do is point guns at 10 of my neighbors and force them to come with me. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you could be much more surgical than the U.S. government can be, has ever shown an interest in being. And there's all kinds of evidence and studies and research that, that shows that there's a huge number of people, vastly more than have been killed, who have now gotten involved in Islamic radicalism and, or going to Iraq to fight and all this simply because they were radicalized by the events. And look, I know, look, I've read about Islam. I know all the stuff the neocons know about Islam. But the question is, why are these specific people doing these specific things at this specific time? Why is it that bin Laden made recruitment tapes for these people showing Western atrocities? Why wouldn't he have just said, open up your Quran? It's all in there. <laughs> he didn't. He said it's these specific things. All right. I mean, he listed actual grievances. He listed the bases. And Now, if it had been the case that for some reason it was absolutely necessary for the safety of America to do all these terrible things, that you would at least have a debate on your hands. But of what possible interest is it for Americans to have troops stationed on the Arabian Peninsula? Of what possible interest is it to the U.S. to be enforcing sanctions against a Saddam Hussein whom no one in his right mind thought was a danger to anybody. I mean, really. I mean, even Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell, before they suddenly changed their minds, were all saying, look, this guy is nothing. He's contained. Nobody cares about him. He's of no threat to anybody whatsoever. Let's talk a little bit more about the book Real Descent and this phrase you use, the index card of allowable opinion. So First of all, why did you put this book together, and what exactly is the index card of allowable opinion that you are out there setting ablaze to? I've been doing a lot of things since 2011, which is when I released my last book before this one. This is number 12 for me. So I, this is the longest I've gone without releasing a book since I started writing them. And I suddenly had a little bit of free time in my hands. <laughs> free time, so-called. So, of course, you had to use that to put a new book together. Right, I know. It's not normal, but I did it. And I did it because... I have a lot of stuff that most people have never seen that I'm really happy with. I think some of my best writing has never appeared in book form before, or it's very, very hard to track down, or it's in some obscure place. And it's I've done a lot of stuff on topics that are of interest to people who listen to my show. For example, about foreign policy, like how to argue with conservatives over foreign policy. You know, how to approach leftists about capitalism, for example, or the Federal Reserve. What do you do when people say? Look, man, you rotten ingrate, the Fed has smoothed out the business cycle. I mean, we've had much more stability in the 20th century than we ever had in the 19th. Why would you not support the Fed? You're just being unreasonable. Like, these are arguments that are going to come up that you are going to have to deal with one way or another. And I've done a lot of stuff on this. And it's, you know, when you write in article form, which a lot of this is, your writing tends to be punchier, livelier, you know, going more for the jugular. So I thought... Since a lot of people like my replies to critics of libertarianism, like when Salon writes a critique or Slate or whatever, people will come to me and say, you got to respond to this. And I do, and then people really enjoy the replies. I thought, well, huh, if you like those, i got a whole bunch of these. So I put them together, categorized them into different parts. There are ten parts of the book on topics of interest to listeners of your show and mine. And I thought, you know, this will be a way for people to learn how to – defend themselves when these arguments come up in their own case to also just to learn more it's not all just about winning debating points but to make sure that this stuff doesn't just languish in obscurity i i want people to read these pieces because i go back and look at stuff i've written in the past a lot of times and say you know gosh this is better than i remember this actually has some good talking points some some good evidence that people can use so i had fun putting it together it's the first book i've ever done self publishing with i've i've gone with some of the biggest publishing houses in the world in the past but i thought just for the heck of it i'm going to publish it i'm going to do it as an inexpensive kindle and a paperback for those who want the hard copy old fashioned people like me and then i actually did the narration of the audiobook myself a typical publisher won't even ask if you want to do it 
They'll just go and hire somebody who is going to read your book the way he would read the instructions for operating a microwave oven. <laughs> and I decided that I think I will read the thing myself. And, and then finally, I designed my own landing page for the book, which where you can get an excerpt and a little video and links to it and links to the audiobook version with me reading it. It's, it's nice to find a domain name that hasn't been taken yet, a .com that hasn't been taken. Well, who was going to have realdescent.com, right? So I, I bought that, and that's where you can find out about the book. Now, in terms of what's the index card of allowable opinion, I kind of devised this idea really during the Ron Paul presidential campaigns because what I loved about the reaction to him was that liberals and conservatives alike just didn't know how to respond to this guy because he just wasn't following the rules. The rules are you say some platitudes and you say, God bless America, and then you go and give another speech, and that's how it's supposed to work. If anything awkward comes up, any question is raised to you that might cause you to lose votes, you change the subject, you dance around it. And here you had a guy who just gave answers, and he gave answers that were not the conventional answers. So if you asked him about the Civil War, he didn't just give the seventh grade textbook rendition about this. Uh, he would say, well, you know, there were long-term ramifications that were not so good in terms of strengthening the central government at the expense of the states and violating the just war tradition or whatever. Now, you're not supposed to say that. I mean, you're supposed to say that it was the most glorious event in the history of mankind that had no bad repercussions because the whole world is a giant comic book with good guys and bad guys, and everything that happened had to turn out the way it did. This is a guy who won't do that or who will say, you know, maybe – our foreign policy choices should be other than bombing or starvation. Like, you know, that maybe there's a third option, or maybe our economic options should be something other than fiscal stimulus or monetary stimulus. You know, I feel oppressed by these limitations of debate. And so I'm going to throw over the whole table and say, no, I don't, I don't accept these limitations on debate. I don't think we should have fiscal or monetary stimulus. I don't think we should bomb or starve. And this just made the media and politicians go berserk. Like they, their brains are not programmed to be able to compute answers like this. Whereas I think Ron gave us such – he made such a contribution to America by refusing to confine himself to these prearranged options that we need to carry forth his work. And so the idea of the book is, this: if you like that, this whole book sets fire to this artificially constrained range of allowable options. Right, I mean, and that's the exact reason why Ron Paul sort of woke so many people up during his presidential campaigns is because he was saying things that were never even brought up before. I mean, he was broaching subjects like blowback, things that we would never hear in the mainstream before. He really expanded that range of allowable opinion, I guess, to the point where you actually hear a blowback discussed in mainstream media now, which is just crazy. And you actually hear dissenting voices against the war on drugs, which we really never heard from politicians before. I mean, we almost take it for granted now that a politician can come out and say favorable things about marijuana or... Oh, I no, I agree. And, and let, me, let me jump in and say that the, the recent uh, controversy between Rand Paul and Marco Rubio was made basically – made possible by Ron Paul. Absolutely. Now, I'm not so sure about Rand Paul, especially – I mean somebody who wants to hire Jesse Benton. That's the, a, the, it's the a little scary. The biggest boob in the history of politics, right, is a, has a judgment. I do not want a uh, chief of staff, Jesse Benton, if you don't you – know, no, you'll pardon me. Especially when I know Rand knew the problems with Jesse, so I don't know what's going on. I, I, my wife and I have a theory that uh, he's blackmailing them or something. Like I can't understand why else he would. But anyway, a separate thing. The point is that in that debate, Rand called Rubio an isolationist, hilarious, for being right? against <laughs> opening to Cuba. And of course, how else could you describe that, right? But that would never. That word would never have been used in that way in the past. It's only used for people who don't want to go to war. But if you're refusing to trade with somebody, that is isolationism, if the word means anything. So it's so great to see an establishment word turned against these people. And that was something – that was a door that Ron opened. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've had my issues here, here and there with Rand and his policies. But 
I mean, I, I love that he just used that, that word isolationism and turned it right back around them because that really is, like you said, what isolationism is. Cutting yourself off from the rest of the world, being belligerent, not engaging in trade. I mean, it's, that's the real definition of isolationism as opposed to when they would use that as a smear against Ron Paul for just, you know, not wanting to bomb people. <laughs> they would call that isolationist. If you don't want to fund terrorists overseas, you're an isolationist. So, I mean, I, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that Ron Paul really laid the foundation for this stuff. To, that we might even take for granted for this even to be a conversation in the public. I mean, I don't know if Obama is necessarily sitting in his office listening to old Ron Paul speeches, but I got to think in some little way, you know, Ron Paul's campaigns, and I mean, this is a big issue for him, you know, lifting embargoes, speaking out against sanctions and that kind of thing. I really think a lot of that debate laid the groundwork for what we're seeing today for opening up relationships with Cuba finally after 40, 50 years. I mean, it's just absurd. Oh, it's true. And, and, and of course, Given that the program has yielded nothing, the regime is still in place down there, that means you can guarantee the political class will want to carry forward with it full steam. The worse it is, the more they want to hold on to it. Right. And, you know, as I have a, I have one of the sections of, of Real Descent is actually about Ron himself. It's, it, I brought together a lot of the things I was writing at the time and afterward about the significance of what this man accomplished and who he really was. And in there, I get to go after some of his most block-headed opponents. And really, that's probably the section I'm the proudest of, because I think in the history of the United States, he's going to be more than a footnote, whereas you'll have to use an almanac to find out who the other Republican candidates in 2008 were, 2012. But he's left an impact, and I go through exactly why. What rules was he breaking? In American society? And what doors has he now opened forever? What things has he said that can never be unsaid? I dedicated one of my books to Ron. I, I dedicated Meltdown, which became a New York Times bestseller about the financial crisis and why it was not caused by the free market and all that. But, you know, as I think about it, I, I really should have dedicated Real Descent to Ron because he exemplifies Real Descent. Let's move on to this, the nullification concept, because I know this is a big concept that you push. You wrote a whole book about it, nullification, how to resist federal tyranny in the 21st century. So can you first just explain for people that might not be familiar with the term, what exactly is nullification and you know why do you see it as such an important strategy for the advancement of liberty? Well, it's a strategy and it's a great strategy because it might work, but also because in pursuing it, it radicalizes people. Uh, nullification goes back not just to Thomas Jefferson, although he articulated it the best. It goes back at least 10 years before that with the Virginia Ratifying Convention, ratifying the Constitution. The long and the short of it is that the federal government, if it has a monopoly on interpreting the Constitution, it's going to interpret a, the Constitution in its own favor at the expense of the states and the people. Therefore, the states have to have some way of interpreting the Constitution and making their interpretation stick. And it was Jefferson's view that in the last resort, the states had to be able to make the determination that the federal government had done something unconstitutional and therefore not to enforce it, not to allow the enforcement of the unconstitutional measure in that particular state. And as I show in that book, Nullification, this was an idea that was at first resisted in New England because New England happened to like an unconstitutional law, the Sedition Act of 1798. They thought it was a wise piece of legislation, and they didn't like the fact that Virginia and Kentucky were threatening to resist it. Well, not 10 years later, when it's somebody else's ox being gored, all of a sudden New England wants to nullify various aspects of Jefferson's embargo on their trade, or they want to nullify what they consider to be unconstitutional searches and seizures of their ships and so on. And by the 1820s, the legislature of Ohio passes a resolution declaring that a majority of Americans believe in the principle of state nullification. Well, what I love about it is, number one, that this is way outside the index card of allowable opinion. The, the New York Times' view is that we libertarians ought to be good losers and just roll over and die. <laughs> but instead, we're actually resurrecting an idea that is forbidden. The New York Times has not approved nullification. I, I mean, what the progressives generally want to do is just always keep us on the defensive. Now they want to take over health care. Once they've done that, we're trying to fight that. They're on to 12 other things. 
and we have to constantly be huffing and puffing to catch up with them. We're supposed to be doing exactly that. They do something, we try and chase after them and, and change it by 3%. But here we are embracing an idea from Thomas Jefferson. So like, what are they going to say? Thomas Jefferson was a bad guy? They don't know what to do. And we're, it's an idea that we're not supposed to do because it's not fashionable. right? Fashionable is embracing the, the expansion of government power, or if you're a conservative and you want to stop it, or you're a libertarian and you really want to stop it, you're supposed to start a think tank, write some policy reports that wind up in the garbage can, <laughs> and then solicit donors for money to write more policy reports that will wind up in the garbage can. But nullification is about saying we're just not going to do it. Forget your policy reports. Forget the New York Times. We're just not going to do it. So the beauty of it is it is actually working in some cases. I mean the, the marijuana thing is a great example. But also it's great because – People who get involved in it, there are a lot of constitutional conservatives out there who have been persuaded of the merits of nullification as a constitutional remedy. But once you start doing that, you begin to learn things. I did a show called Nullification, the Gateway Drug. This is at TomWoods.com slash 308 for episode 308. And in that episode, I talk about what people learn when they start in on this strategy. They learn, number one, that the conservative and libertarian think tanks are not worth much because uh, they're going to fight you tooth and nail. They're going to side with the federal government against you tooth and nail. So you learn that, hey, the Heritage Foundation is not really on my side. They really just want to keep things going the way they are, and they want to earn salaries for writing policy reports. Correct. So that's an important thing to learn. You learn the total corruption of the legal profession in America. Every one of them is taught American nationalism. In law school, not one of them knows a single thing about the tradition of Jeffersonian decentralization. So you learn that. And you also learn that right wing radio, which is supposed to be full of patriots who just want to save America, they will not even mention the word nullification. So it it radicalizes people when they get involved in this cause. They realize, wait a minute, the problems with America go well beyond Barack Obama. It's also the people I thought were part of the solution. They're also part of the problem. This is all very healthy. So you see it not only as an effective strategy, but also a situation where, say, somebody who's just opposed to Obamacare and they get involved with their own state movement to, I guess, you know, fight that law. And that can kind of lead them to see the other ways in which the federal government is really not acting in their favor, which talk radio, like you said, has been not acting in their favor and I guess really open up their mind to uh, other concepts. Is that basically how you see that? Yeah, that that is. And it, the funny thing is when I came out with the book in 2010, I knew Ron Paul was considering running for president again. And now he's blurbed a lot of my books. And I thought, you know, I don't want to I don't want him to have this nullification albatross around his neck the whole campaign. So I won't ask him this time for a blurb. So I got blurbs from Judge Andrew Napolitano, from Walter Williams, from Barry Goldwater Jr. Those are pretty good blurbs. Well, then he goes out on the campaign trail and he actually advocates nullification repeatedly on the campaign trail. So I don't I didn't know. I mean, I I shouldn't have doubted the guy. You know, I, I should have realized, wait a minute. To the contrary, he's probably going to be talking about the idea out there while he's campaigning. Tom, I've got just a couple more questions. But first, I want to take a minute to tell my listeners about our sponsor, My Academy of Health Excellence, and their amazing product, Health Excellence Select. Now, until last year, I was just like you guys. I saw my health insurance cost double and my deductibles skyrocket thanks to the Obamacare health insurance mandates. Determined not to participate in this corporatist scheme, I sought an alternative and found out about health sharing, a fantastic concept in which your monthly fees go directly to pay the medical bills of others, not into the pockets of some crony capitalist fat cat. Health Excellence Select combines health sharing with a patient care personal assistant, 24-7 phone access to board-certified physicians, and discounts on dental, vision, and other benefits. The best part is that for most people, plans with Health Excellence Select are much more affordable than Obamacare insurance, and it meets the legal mandate, so you will not be fined for using it in lieu of insurance. For more information, head on over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. Now, Tom, I know you consider yourself an anarchist, and I think a lot of people out there might say, well, you know, Tom, if you're an anarchist, 
you know, why do you care about states' rights? Why are states' rights relevant? You know, aren't the states, as we see them really in many ways, just kind of smaller versions of federal tyranny in the sense that, you know, the states are not based on uh, private property ownership. They're based on fiat land grabs, just in kind of a mini way, as opposed to the federal government. So what would you say to, to somebody that says that, that just doesn't see a contradiction between anarchy and between supporting states' rights? Well, I would agree with them. I don't like the states either. I don't like states. But that's why I want to try and see if I can get them to do something useful. I mean, as, you know, the, given that all they do is harass me and loot me, it might be nice if they did something productive once in a while. And standing up to the federal government is something productive. And, of course, it's not so much that I'm trying to vindicate the rights of Massachusetts or the rights of Florida or the rights of Vermont or anything else. It's that I'm trying to vindicate the rights of the individuals who live in those places. Look, the states are what we have. Like it or not, they are what we have. They are the part and parcel of the American tradition. So given that they're what we have, we might as well put them to some use other than looting and expropriating us and instead saying to the federal government, no, we're not going to allow you to come in here. We're not going to allow you to spy. I mean, I think it's great, for example, what Utah, what's been going on in Utah where they've been trying to come up with, well, actually, it's a number of states, but Utah in particular, they come up with this idea what if we shut off the water to the NSA facility here in Utah? Now, that, that facility needs 1.7 million gallons of water every single day to cool off the, the spying computers. So without water, they can't function. And you may say, ah, but you'll never, they'll, nobody will ever be courageous enough to shut it down. Or if they do shut it down, they'll just go to another state. All right, well, that, these other states are starting to pass laws saying, if you do come into our state, you ain't getting no water. So they're trying to preemptively stop it. Okay, even if they couldn't do that, they've come up with another idea. Any evidence that is acquired through these means will be inadmissible in any court in this state. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, that's all very libertarian. There's no libertarian in the world who could be against any of that. And so for that reason, and that reason alone, I support these state-level efforts. Not because I like states, but I don't like the federal government. It's that I like liberty, and I know people who believe in liberty who are at the state level coming up with counter strategies to deal with the federal government that I think are exciting. Well, and you know, as a matter of fact, I was in Utah last year for a big event that the Libertas Institute, which has been really behind all this, was having. And when I was there, there were legislators in the audience. There was a very plausible gubernatorial candidate in the audience. And I said, now, it's great that you guys are doing your best and trying to fight back, and that's wonderful. But let me tell you something. If you want to do something that's going to matter, do this. Do this. Support this initiative against the NSA. Because anything else you do about, you know, eminent domain or whatever, that's super and people are going to like that. But if you want to do something that's going to get you in the history books, I guarantee you, you will be in the history books if you shut down this NSA facility, then do this. But instead, if you want to just have a career that's totally safe, and you stay on the reservation, and you don't do anything courageous, by all means, you're free to do that. But just remember, you will be in obscurity forever, and no one will remember you ever lived. Like, I put it that, I thought, you know what, let me appeal to vanity if that's what it takes. Because people will remember that you lived if you do this. Yeah, I absolutely love that that movement, that, that shutting down. I think it's called off now, the shutting off yeah. the water to the NSA facilities in Utah, because... Hey, if they can't store that data, well, it's not going to be be of very much use to them. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll prevent them from really maybe being able to do it in the future. So uh, definitely little ways like that are ways we can kind of fight tyranny on whatever level. Unfortunately, not every state is really um, on board with all the good things. You know, we've seen a lot of states uh, nullify marijuana laws on several levels. Some are just doing it in the medical marijuana. Some have even gone all the way to recreational marijuana and allowing that to be legal in the meantime, we have other states, I'm sure you've seen here, that Oklahoma and Nebraska are actually suing Colorado over its legalization of marijuana. So clearly there are other states where the majority of people are maybe um, you know, not as inclined to freedom as, as some others. So I'm curious, I just want to run this kind of hypothetical by you that I sort of dreamed up here. Now, let's picture a situation where the roles were kind of reversed. Let's say we saw states like we do see right now sort of with Oklahoma and Nebraska that are saying, you know, we want to keep marijuana illegal. We we don't like that this other state next to us is keep, is making it legal. And let's say the federal government actually wanted to step in. Obviously, that's not their current posture at all. But if the federal government actually finally took the stance of, you know what, 
we're ending the war on drugs. We don't think we should be pursuing, you know, people who use marijuana, heroin, any of that stuff. But what if there are still states then that say, well, we do. We think it's wrong. We think we should put people in jail for this stuff. Would you support a kind of a federal nullification of states, even though that's really not the way the Constitution is laid out? But in concept, I mean, that would be defending individual rights. So how would you view that scenario? Okay, that is a very good question because it feeds into two different ways of thinking about this and, and figuring out which one should trump the other. On the one hand, there is the view that it's best to have many different jurisdictions. So that was Hayek's view, that the more jurisdictions you have and the smaller the states are, the more likely liberty is to flourish for a variety of different reasons. On the other hand, there is the view that even if you have a centralized government, it could still do good things for you. You know, it could abolish this or that bad practice. It could impose liberty on the states. And Walter Block's view is that I'm perfectly okay if the federal government does the right thing. I don't care if it's constitutional or not. If it does the right thing and tries to prevent coercion, then, you know, I can support even that as long as it's just doing something that stops coercion. And, you know, in the old days, I would have said, you know, I think on balance, I still have to say that the states can have the right to be stupid. And, you know, if you don't like it, at least you have a possibility to move. Whereas the federal government may be your friend today, but when it's your enemy, you have nowhere to go. And now it has a precedent. It's built up precedents for getting involved in the lives of the states. And yes, it's your friend now, but is it going to be your friend next year? Like, for example, what if the United Nations said we're going to get rid of the drug war all around the world? I personally think that'd be a mixed blessing because what's the United Nations going to want to do next? These are all concerns. And to be perfectly honest with you, I don't have an easy answer to that. Of course, my libertarian instinct is I don't want those states doing those things. But my long-term concern is you know, I think the federal government in the long run is a bigger threat to liberty than Oklahoma is. And even though in the short run it can help me with Oklahoma, in the long run, I bet I'm going to want Oklahoma to help me against it. Of course, it'd be nice to give you a quick pat response, but I'll tell you that I just really am conflicted in my mind about where ultimately I would come down on that. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, uh, the best we can really do, like you kind of said earlier, is just support who's right. So if the federal government says something right, like Obama right now, you can argue he's not going about the embargo in the proper way. He's not going through Congress and that kind of thing. And maybe if I was going to be a, a strict follow by the rules guy, I would condemn him for that. But in reality, I love what he's doing on this issue. I love that he's finally opening up trade to Cuba. So I'm not really going to condemn him for maybe not doing it in the exact way that the Constitution or, you know, may have laid it out or what have you. So you know, it's not easy when we have a system that's so convoluted that, you know, it asserts powers in so many different ways. But, you know, yeah, like I said, I think the end of the end of the day, all we can really do is state what is correct and, and, and hope that the right things kind of happen and that more people really understand the right way to do things and the right way to see our interactions with other individuals because ultimately one way or another even coercive governments are a reflection of some amount of their population that supports their bad ideas so i mean maybe not everybody in oklahoma is against marijuana and wants it to be illegal but i would i would reckon that enough of that population at least supports the politicians that feel that way to somewhat represent that state. So, I mean, all we can really do is try to be as consistent and principled as possible along the way. Uh, Tom, one more question before I let you go here. It's a question I've been asking my guests lately. I'm curious, what is one book, other than, of course, the dozen or so that you've written, that you would recommend to people who are interested in the ideas of liberty? Maybe people that are new to the movement, maybe they have stumbled upon this interview somehow and they want to learn more. So what would you recommend to people? Well, especially for newbies, but I think it can do some good as a refresher for people who've been around a long time, would be Ron Paul's book, The Revolution, A Manifesto. And I say that because I've had many experiences with people who have changed their minds. They've become libertarians from either being left liberals or neoconservatives or whatever. They've had their minds changed by that book. And in particular, the foreign policy chapter of that book lays out systematically Ron Paul's view on foreign policy, which he was only able to give in brief snippets in those debates, and people were not necessarily persuaded you know, by a 20-second remark, but they have been persuaded by that chapter. And it, it's, it's a short book, so if you give it to a friend, you don't have to worry that it's going to sit on the shelf for 10 years. It's, uh, I think it's less than 200 pages, but it packs a punch, and it's, it's effective. Uh, yeah, and I can attest myself that that book has been effective. I, I remember back when that book came out, I was, I was buying copies and giving it to everybody. And I have a few people that literally would call me the next day and say, 
All right, I'm on board. I totally get it now. And with people that would see the debates and the same kind of people that would see the debates and go, I don't know, he sounds kind of kooky. Well, yeah, some things might sound kooky in a sound bite when you've been brainwashed all these years with all this propaganda. But when you actually take the time to sit down and read his explanations, it really does make so much sense. And he has such a clear way, which a skill I think you have of too, a clear way of really writing and, you know, explaining things in a way that really makes sense to regular people you know it's it doesn't you don't need to be a scholar to to read this stuff and start to get it and the same goes for your book real descent which i highly recommend people check out uh it really is a great for people on the go you know i'm, I'm always moving here and there and trying to kind of read stuff on the way to this and on the way to that and i have it on my kindle and it's great that they're just like really short articles because you can just take three to five minutes read an article and then you know bring it out later on when you have more time so i do recommend real descent and tom before i let you go of course i want to give you a chance to plug all of your projects. We might need another hour to do that effectively, but why don't you let everybody know where they can find your current work, your show five day a week. Again, it blows my mind that you can do a five day a week show. Uh, where can everybody find all the projects that you're working on? Well, the easiest way is just to go to tomwoods.com because everything I'm doing, you'll see right there on the homepage, the daily show where you can subscribe on iTunes. Where I've had all kinds of interesting guests. Uh, I think I've done over 300 episodes so far. And then you'll see also on that page the courses that I've done for the Ron Paul Homeschool curriculum. You can get that at ronpaulhomeschool.com, but you can also find out specifically about my courses at tomwoods.com in that little box. Plus, my books are linked there. I've just had my site redesigned, and it's a very clean, uncluttered way of laying out all the things I'm doing so it just doesn't look too busy. I'm really pleased with how it came out. So tomwoods.com is where to go. Tom Woods, thanks so much for coming on the show. Once again, I really did enjoy talking to you. And, you know, we'll have to do it again sometime because you have so many subjects that you're knowledgeable on out there. And, you know, I think you're a really great voice in the liberty movement. And keep up the great work. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks a lot, Tom. Take care. All right, everybody. That's the show for today. Show notes page is tomwoods.com slash 313. Remember also from the other day when we were talking to Connor Boyack, you got to check out that Tuttle Twins series of books. Very, very helpful in conveying important ideas to a young audience. Two volumes already, one book on, well, talking about the, uh, the ideas raised in Bastiat's book, The Law, but conveying them in a way that children can understand. And the more recent book takes Leonard Reed's important essay, I Pencil, and conveys those ideas to a young audience. Check out not just one, but both of those books at tomwoods.com slash twins. All right, that's the show for today, everybody. Jim Babb tomorrow. We'll see you then. The Tom Woods Show.